Okay, we are going to get started for the afternoon sessions. Uh, thank you for joining us again. So uh, I would like to introduce Drew Russ, who is part of our Startup BD uh, Venture Capitalist team. Uh, so please, round of applause to welcome uh, Drew. Cool, this is on. Thanks, Mackenzie. Appreciate that. <clears throat> um, first, thanks, everybody, for coming out today. Uh, I hope the morning sessions were, were helpful. The feedback and conversation I've had have indicated they were, and, and hopefully we continue that through the afternoon. Like I said, I know I'm going to just re repeat myself, but the, if you're looking for the technical track, it's upstairs. This is the business track. Excited to have you all here. Um, so today I'm going to be uh, talking about venture capital. Uh, and this presentation is called VC 101, um, how, what, and why VCs do what they do and what you should know as a founder. Um, so before I dive in, though, just a quick kind of straw poll here. Uh, how many folks here are founders of their own companies? Awesome. Okay. How many folks have raised venture capital? Okay, cool. This is great. So the, hopefully this will be helpful to a lot of folks. For those that you have gone through the process, some of this may be redundant. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, I hope it's helpful. So a quick overview and introduction here. Uh, a little bit about me, uh, purely so you know why I feel I'm able to get up here and talk about this topic. I've been uh, at AWS for four years, just about four years. Uh, as Mackenzie said, I'm on the startup business development team, specifically the venture capital business development team. What that means is that really I, I work with um, well-known venture capital funds that are funding uh, uh, innovation and through their portfolio companies, folks like Andreessen Horowitz and Excel Partners, SV Angel here in New York, folks like Graycroft or Union Square, uh, LA Upfront Ventures, and we partner with them to sort of drive programming and, and knowledge sharing uh, through their partnership as well as through their portfolio companies, and we partner with folks across the rest of the organization to sort of add value to those venture-funded companies. Uh, prior to joining AWS, uh, I spent about five years, just shy of that, in venture capital in Palo Alto at a firm called Triangle Peak Partners. Uh, and before that, I was in finance here in New York, uh, which isn't really pertinent to, uh, to what I'm doing now. But, uh, but the five years experience in venture capital uh, allows me to sort of speak to this topic. Um, I did over 40 equity transactions over those five years, uh, multi-stage, so everything from, at that time, Series B through through IPO. In terms of check sizes today, that would probably be seed through pre-IPO, just given uh, how large earlier rounds have gotten. Um, and kind of focused across the spectrum in terms of segments and industries that we invested in. Uh, these are just a handful of companies that I uh, led some deals in, SnapLogic, Marin, Ping, Sojourn. Again, more really just to give context on, on uh, where my opinion and thoughts come from on this topic. So really quick, um, this is what we're going to discuss today. We have 45 minutes. I'm going to save Q&A for the very end, and I'm going to try to compress this down so we have time for that. Uh, but uh, so I may skip over some things that I feel we can probably address in Q&A. Uh, but these are the broad strokes. So for the definition and theory uh, of venture capital, the mechanics, how are funds structured, why are they structured that way, how do VCs think about time, how do VCs make money, uh, and then also the roles and responsibilities within a VC firm. Uh, to give some clarity to that, the difference between an associate and an analyst and a principal and a partner and a general partner and all of that. Um, then we're going to talk, we're going to talk today primarily about what I would call traditional VC, um, which again, a lot of those firms I mentioned are exactly what they do. Uh, there are a lot of different types of funding mechanisms, and in particular, there's a lot of different types of, of venture capital. And so I'll touch on uh, some of those at the very end. And, and examples of that are like corporate venture capital. How is that different than, you know, going into an independent fund? Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about a glimpse of VC 201. This is a presentation 101 that I've given at this loft before. I've also given a presentation called 201. Um, so this is not really a, a, a sneak peek of that. It's more of just touching on some topics that I covered in 201 as well uh, so that we can kind of bleed into that if we need to. Okay, so quickly, so what is venture capital? So venture capital is a form of private equity. Uh, private equity is generally investment of capital into private entities or private businesses, uh, as opposed to public market companies raising capital on the open markets uh, through equity or debt offerings. Um, but there's obviously a key difference between uh, VCs and private equity. Um, but first, I'm going to hit on some of the, the commonalities. Both are professional money managers, right? Both of these folks are given capital by investors called limited partners, uh, and their job is to provide a return on that investment, a significant return on that investment, in a relatively short time frame. 
So for folks who may invest in the public markets or have money managers, you're generally thinking very long term, maybe decades even, around how you're going to grow that portfolio and grow that wealth. Private equity and venture capital think really in sort of increments under 10 years, right, for a single fund. Um, and so they are high growth, high return, high risk asset classes uh, that folks are paid a wage uh, to make bets in uh, on behalf of their investors. So uh, they're a subset of private equity, like I said. Uh, one of the, oh, sorry. One of the differences primarily between venture capital and what I call traditional private equity, which most people think of as uh, LBO firms or majority stake owner firms, private equity companies that are coming in, buying a majority of a company, 50% plus, so they have you know, basically full control of that company, and generally are focused on optimizing that business to make it leaner and meaner so that they can sell it again for you know, a multiple on that investment. Uh, venture capital is different in that they're generally in, you're generally not investing as a majority owner. You're taking a piece of the business. Um, and you're investing generally earlier with the idea of help hoping that company grows at such a rate as to exit either via a merger or acquisition or an IPO. Uh, and once that exit occurs, the value of the business you invested in is significantly higher uh, at the time of exit. So PE is more about optimizing. These are broad strokes, by the way. There's a lot of different types of private equity firms. PE is more about optimizing a business and kind of flipping it. Pri or venture capital is, is a little bit more about uh, investing in hyper growth uh, and helping a business scale uh, from very small to very large. So again, I just want to hit on, I mentioned sort of this high risk, high return. This is a chart that I made. It's not scientific. Uh, it's probably off a little bit here or there. But it gives you just a general look at where venture capital and private equity sit relative to each other in terms of the risk return spectrum, uh, as well as re in relation to potentially other investment vehicles that you could invest in. So. Um, you can just kind of get a sense of money market funds obviously being extremely low risk, uh, but pretty low return uh, in exchange for that low risk versus venture capital, private equity, high risk, higher return. So what is venture capital, uh, sort of the theory here? So venture capitalists, like portfolio managers of traditional assets, uh, tend to use what you call a portfolio approach. So they want to capture a distribution of probabilities across their investments. Now, obviously, every investment a VC makes, they're making that investment, assuming that investment or hoping that investment is going to be successful and doing everything they can to make it so. But in reality, that's not the case. And we'll get into some statistics around uh, the success rate of, of venture funds uh, on the next slide. But this distribution generally follows a pretty simple rule of thumb. Uh, and Fred Wilson, Union Square Ventures, uh, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with Fred, uh, obviously based here in New York. Uh, has this saying that he is very, very well known for saying, which is kind of, you know, one third of the deals that we look at uh, and invest in, we expect to lose our entire investment. So I put 100 bucks in, just using random numbers here. I expect to get none of it back. Uh, one third, we expect to get some money back, maybe, uh, maybe get our money back or get a little bit more. We call that like a one times multiple invested capital or 1.1, just a little bit. Uh, and then the last third of our investments really generate the bulk of the return. So there's this kind of, uh, concentration and distribution effect of returns, where a small number of the investments they make in a portfolio pay for all of the other investments that they lost money on or just made their money back. Power law dynamic uh, is a term that gets thrown around in this regard, uh, or Pareto effect, the Pareto analysis, sort of 20% of the constituents deliver 80% of the returns. It's actually even higher in venture capital. Uh, but that's important to understand and remember in terms of how, people, how VCs look at their portfolio and how they make decisions based on uh, continuing to fund a company maybe after multiple rounds of financing as they look at the opportunity cost of that capital. Uh, they're generally, a lot of funds operate differently, but generally funds will tend to allocate capital in successive rounds into those winners so they can increase their exposure to that last third of the distribution, uh, if that makes sense. But the reality is uh, most startups fail, uh, which I think everybody knows. Uh, again, high risk, high return. Uh, not every single startup funded could be successful. Uh, the market couldn't absorb that, and, and there's just not enough problems out there necessarily for all those solutions. Um, the data on this is spread around. People have different opinions. Generally speaking, uh, the rule of thumb here is about 90% of startups fail. Um, now, the definition of failure can mean a lot of different things, right? That can mean making no money, being selling it for a lower valuation, and not making your money back. Uh, when I say that 90%, generally that's what I mean. Um, it means sort of not generating the return uh, that represents a, a significant multiple on the invested capital. 
So again, that Pareto sort of effect, right, of 80-20 in, in startup land, it's more 90-10 um, or 10-90. Um, so as you can see on the chart on the left, this is where that's highlighted, right? So um, almost 65% of deals done uh, returned zero to one X, multiple investment capital. So almost two thirds of all deals done lose money for investors. Uh, about 25% generate in the range of one to five X on the return. Pretty, pretty big range, but basically you can think, re you know, return something that's worthy of somebody uh, having made the investment in the first place from their perspective. And then rapidly this declines, right? So 6% make five to 10 X, two and a half, 10 to 20, uh, 1%, 20 to 50, and about half a percent make over 50x, which obviously is a significant return on your capital in the time frame that generally these returns occur, which is anywhere from you know four to 10 years, sometimes earlier, sometimes a little bit later. Um, so anyway, you can see how that distribution is, is um, uh, plays out in real life. And then on the right side here, um, we talk, we, it, this, this chart sort of highlights fund performance. So again, highlighting sort of this distribution of uh, outcomes in that last third uh, of wins that generate the bulk of returns for VCs. Um, and it's hard to read this here, but basically funds that return more than 5X to their LPs, their investors, uh, generally have about 20% of their deals that return more than 10X. So I know that, that might sound confusing, but basically 20% of the fund returned more than 10X, which allowed them to return 5X overall across all the investments they made back to their investors. So again, uh, Bill Gurley is famous for this quote as well. A lot of people use similar quotes. Uh, it's not a home run business, it's a grand slam business. Uh, the really, really big winners are the ones that generate returns for venture capital investors and their LP investors. Uh, so they're again, really focused on finding those breakout huge winners. Uh, and when they do, or since they have some, they're gonna put as much capital as they can, uh, again, using you know, sound business logic and sound fund management logic into those big winners so they get as much exposure there as possible. Uh, okay, so kind of cover the theory there uh, on kind of you know, how VCs think broadly about uh, their role and their job and how they optimize around making investments in their fund. Uh, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about venture capital mechanics. Um, it's actually a new slide that I put in here. I had a much worse one before, but this one's a little more helpful. This sort of, sort of shows the fund flows within a venture fund, starting with the limited uh, partners or the investors, uh, which are kind of right in the middle of the slide who provide capital to VCs who are the general partner. Uh, and that capital they provide is just like providing capital to your, uh, to your portfolio manager. You're giving them money to increase the value of that asset, increase that money and return more to you. Uh, again, the main difference is in a pretty short period of time uh, with regard to venture. Uh, so VCs fundraise too. Uh, something that people, I think most people know, but sometimes forget. Uh, usually every three to four years, they're out raising another fund based on the performance of their last fund. So in that regard, VCs and founders share a little bit of the pain of having to go out and tell the story uh, consistently. VCs have to do it less frequently, for sure, but nonetheless, they are stewards and fiduciaries of other people's capital. Uh, sometimes individual VCs invest in their own funds, but again, they have people they are answering to as well in terms of performance. So something to keep in mind, again, when you're receiving feedback from a VC or you have a VC investment, uh, and you're talking about follow-on rounds, uh, having some understanding and, and not sympathy, but empathy for kind of what they're trying to do as well uh, is key. After fundraising, they're obviously making evaluations and investments in companies. Uh, they continue to monitor those companies' performance, sometimes injecting more capital into it in follow-on rounds. So if they invested in a Series A or a seed round, the next round they may have allocated capital to put to work there for a variety of reasons. One, if they feel a business is being successful, and has a good exit opportunity down the line, you wanna put as many chips into that company as possible. Um, and also you wanna maintain your, your ownership percentage, so you don't wanna be diluted, which is another topic we'll get into a little bit. Uh, and in order to do so, you need to continue to up your ante in the company as they raise larger and larger rounds. Um, and then of course the exit. So folks, again, either generally, you know, it's a liquidity event, either captured through an acquisition, uh, rarely a merger, sometimes a merger, acquisition or an IPO. When the company goes public, uh, and the proceeds from that public filing and offering uh, are made available to the investors, the private investors. Uh, the funds they receive back from that are then distributed back to their LPs uh, as returns on those funds. 
uh, and then down the line, they probably go back to the same LPs and said, hey, we did good by you last time. Would you be willing to do fund two or fund three or fund four? Uh, and we'll get a little bit again into sort of the distribution and, and how the VCs actually take some chips off the table. Uh, I'm sorry? Can you turn the volume up? Is this better? This better? OK, great. Thank you. Um, and so we'll get a little bit into how VC sort of takes the money off the table during this whole process as well. But this is the general fund flow. Um, and the thing I always just want to make sure to highlight, everything's fairly obvious in here, uh, but just the LP-GP relationship, uh, always remembering that. Um, so a little bit more on the mechanics here. Um, time, whoop, time as a concept is a big factor uh, for VCs for a variety of reasons. Some are obvious, some, some maybe not so much. Um, but there's really two important concepts to think about with regard to time uh, when you're thinking about a venture fund. And these are, these are two terms. One's called a commitment period, and one is called investment period. So when a VC raises a new fund, say a VC raises a 20 million or let's say a $100 million fund from those LPs, basically they have five years to plant seeds, if you will, to make new investments in companies from that fund. So they have $100 million. Uh, they're going to go out, they're going to look at it and evaluate companies. They're going to identify the ones they want to make investments in. They're going to populate their portfolio with portfolio companies. Some will get more money, some will get less. That has more to do with the independent or the individual deal dynamics of each deal. Uh, but they'll spend about five years sort of planting seeds, going out and finding new deals. Now during that time, companies that they invest in early may need to raise new rounds and they may put some money into it. Uh, but the idea here is they typically have five years. Um, and a typical fund usually is about 10 years long. So LPs agree to give capital to VCs for about 10 years. Uh, you have 10 years to kind of make something happen with my money. So the first half of the fund is focused on finding those new investments. Um, generally, when you have a new investment, you allocate a reserve. So uh, what that means is when you have a $100 million fund, and let's say you, just for simplicity's sake, let's say you make uh, five investments each of a $10 million. So you have $50 million of your capital deployed. Let's say in that same time period you decide you're going to allocate 100% reserve to each of those, meaning I want to hold on to a little bit of capital so that if that company that I invested in a Series A goes out to raise a Series B, I have some money to put back into that company. I haven't spent it all uh, in my first round of investing across the portfolio. So in that case, if you had 100% allocated in reserve, you'd have $10 million raised with the remaining $50 million to allocate into each of those companies if they do raise. It never works out exactly like that, but again, just for... Uh, simplicity's sake in that example, uh, that's, that's kind of how that works. And so this is why VCs are out raising funds every three to five years, right? So when this five-year period is over, and we'll talk about investment period in a second, um, they're basically out of, quote unquote, dry powder for new deals, right? Uh, they have those reserve uh, capital for the deals they've done. They don't really have any capital left to go out and start making new investments in new companies. And so that's when you hear fund, you know, I'm raising fund two or fund three or fund four. Um, and they do it a little preemptively, because it's fundraising. There's probably folks in here who have gone out and raised money for your own business. Uh, it can be very time consuming, and it can take longer than expected sometimes. So they start that a little bit early, uh, generally every three to five years. Um, it, as a sidebar, an interesting trend that's been occurring more recently has slowed down, I'd say, in the last nine months. But for the two years prior to that, you were seeing a real compression in that time frame. You were seeing funds come out and raise another fund after only a year or 18 months. A lot of debate on why that was. My personal opinion is generally when, you know, when, th when times are good, you want to take advantage of that. So folks were new pension funds and other folks were putting a lot of money into VC. And so you should capture that interest at the time and raise those funds kind of opportunistically. There was a lot of other, other interesting perspectives on that that just generally might take. But generally, it's three to five years. And then you have your investment period. Um, and again, this is the length of the time a fund can remain active. And again, that generally almost all the time. But there's always uh, exceptions, of course. Generally, it's about 10 years. So when an LP goes to, a, v, to a, a GP or a VC fund and says, hey, I'm willing to give you $10 million, one, that LP doesn't generally write a check for $10 million and just give it to the VC. Uh, and a lot of people may ask why, a variety of reasons. LPs want to hold on to their money, and, and uh, the time value of money is a whole concept. They could probably invest that in a money market fund and make a small return on it. Uh, and so what they do instead of giving that all up front is generally they have what they call a drawdown fund and they have capital calls. So when I'm a VC and I find this new deal, say I raise that $100 million fund, I find my first deal, 
uh, and I need my 10 million bucks to wire to that company and put in their bank account. I send a letter out to all my LPs who agreed that they would supply me with the capital when I asked for it. Uh, and I say, hey, got a great deal. You need 10 million bucks based on your, you know, your ownership or your uh, uh, participation in the, in the GP. You, know, you owe me three million, you owe me four, you owe me one, you owe me two. Uh, everybody wires that money over and the money gets sent. Now again, it doesn't always hap happen exactly like that. It's usually done a little bit more in advance and you have some, some capital in the bank. But um, from a mechanical perspective, that's how that works. Um, so for the remaining five years after a, com after a fund has made these initial investments, is really kind of the, the harvest period, right? Now it's kind of working with that, port the, that portfolio of companies to optimize for the best possible exit that they can achieve. Uh, and again, VCs are professional money managers. They're there to take some money and turn it into a whole lot more. And so either founders are very aligned with that, like, yeah, we all want to go big and we want to grow really quickly and we want to exit. Uh, and sometimes there's less alignment there where it's more, we're going to go slow and steady. So you hear sometimes the, the harping on startup ecosystem or VCs of growth at all costs. Uh, and anything done at all costs is probably not a great idea. But the reason there's such hyper focus on growth is that short time frame uh, and the need to return that significant amount of capital to LPs quickly. Uh, and growth is one of the key indicators of that that gets them a higher multiple uh, or higher value on the business uh, when they do exit. So you have that kind of five year period to do that. Um, and of course, you're also raising new funds at the same time and making new investments that are new funds, but uh, it's kind of this you know, ladder cascading effect. Um, one comment on the 10 year period. So extensions, of course, are allowed. Uh, usually in any document that a fund creates and agrees to with an LP, there's usually two one year extensions allowed. So, hey, we're, you know, we, still have, we still haven't exited some of these companies. We hold this illiquid uh, stock in these companies, these securities. Uh, give, us, give us another year to try to figure out how to monetize these, uh, and we'll get it back to you. And hey, another year passes, still haven't figured it out. Give me one more year, one more chance, and I'll try to do it. Uh, and both GPs and LPs are generally OK with this, because if nothing happens after 12 years, the fund usually just goes to the LP and goes, hey, instead of cash, here's this really liquid preferred security in this company that you probably don't know a whole lot about, but I do. See what you can do with it. So that's why that extension's built in, is to try to be able to monetize those preferred securities uh, or securities in general. Um, yeah, and then also there's uh, oftentimes secondary sales, right? So folks may take those ownership stakes and those funds uh, before the extension period and sell it to another LP for a discounted price, saying, you know, for 50 cents on the dollar, I'll give you exposure to this fund. It hasn't worked out for me, but maybe with that valuation, you'll be able to generate a return. So those are the two uh, primary time epochs, if you will, or, or periods of time in a fund that people think about. Commitment period with an overall investment period. Um, okay, so how VCs make money. Um, again, you know, uh, a lot of people are, are uh, in startups for a variety of reasons. Uh, make huge impact, change the world, build a great business. Um, and you know, a lot of the time making money is a component of that, for sure. For VCs, they're professional money managers, so that's their job is to make money. Um, and a lot of different tactics go into that, uh, whether they're founder friendly or they're a little more standoffish. At the end of the day, it's definitely about supporting innovators, inventors, entrepreneurs. But again, with the ultimate goal, they wouldn't be in business if they didn't generate a return for their LPs. Uh, they'd have to shut down shop and wouldn't be able to give anybody any capital. So they're always thinking about that. That said, they're also thinking personally around, well, how do I uh, not only keep my lights on, but you know, make a lot of money doing this job. Um, can't blame them for that. Uh, management fees and carried interest are the two primary mechanisms venture capitalists uh, leverage to make money uh, for themselves and for the fund. Um, and I'm going to talk about management fees real quick, which doesn't get a lot of attention. It's pretty boring. It's pretty standard. Uh, but I'm going to definitely spend time on carried interest, which I think is a term a lot of people hear. That term carry gets thrown around a lot. Uh, I'm not sure everyone always understands it clearly. It's, it's, a, it's an interesting concept. Took me a long time to fully get my arms around it, actually, uh, particularly in practice of when actually carry kicks in. So, um, <coughs> sorry, um, management fees. Management fees are very typical to like, if you own a mutual fund, uh, or you have a money manager, uh, it's a fee that you pay on your assets under management. So you have $100 at a market uh, or at a mutual fund, uh, and it's a 1% management fee. You pay one buck a year for them to manage your money. Now, obviously, the goal you hope is that that fund grows significantly more than 1% in that year. 
so you're not paying people to lose you money. Uh, but sometimes that does happen, of course. Uh, but that's the idea. So when LPs commit their capital, they usually pay uh, the fund management fees in the range of 1.5% to 2.5% annually. Generally, it's paid out quarterly. Um, so it's an annual fee, but paid out quarterly. And this is, um, for better or worse, VCs generally refer to this as kind of the things they use to keep the lights on. Pay salaries, pay bills, ongoing kind of operating expenses uh, to continue to function the fund um, and to pay their employees. Um, looping back to the prior slide, which, yeah, I remember commitment period was that period of five years, excuse me, in which they were able to make new investments. Once you, basically what you're paying a VC to do is find you new investments. You're certainly paying them to exit those investments, obviously, but you're trying to, you know, you're paying them to be out there hunting, finding new deals and investing in those. So after that commitment period, the logical conclusion was, well, I'm not going to still pay you 2.5%. You're just kind of harvesting these deals now. You're not really doing as much as you were before in terms of the value add of the overall return that I'm expecting. So that fee begins to taper down after, after five years. So you're not paying them 2.5% to just monitor their portfolio. You're paying them 2.5% to build their portfolio. And then after that, it tapers off. Again, they've probably raised a new fund by then, and those new management fees on that five-year commitment period are now really the bulk of what they're using to, quote, unquote, keep the lights on. But now to carried interest. Um, so carried interest is, a, is an interesting concept. Carried interest is really how VCs make a lot of money, right? So when they have those huge wins, or any win, but when they have those huge wins, this is where they get to really kind of line their pockets. And, and rightly so. They have, they're returning significant capital to their LPs. They should be able to participate in sort of profit sharing of that as well, or at least that's the argument. Um, and so what carried interest is, is once you, once, um, and I'll, I'll use it on a deal basis versus a fund-wide basis. It gets a little more complicated when you're talking about 20 different deals all at different valuations and returns. But on one deal, for example, if we invest $10 million in that deal uh, and we exit that company for, uh, let me make sure I can do the math on whatever I put in front of me, for $20 million, that's a $10 million profit, right? So LP gave you 10, you gave them back 20. Uh, and if you made that, if you, you know, made that exit in six years, 100% return in six years on $10 million is a pretty amazing thing for anybody uh, versus putting that $10 million in the stock market. And depending on the year, you may have made a lot, you may have made a little, whatever it may be. So of that $10 million now, since you've now returned at least 100% of the capital, meaning you know, I gave you your $10 million back plus another 10, uh, generally carried interest is pegged at about 20% of quote unquote profits or capital return above the initial capital raised. So in that scenario, uh, a VC would keep two million of the excess 10 they're giving back and give the other eight. So at the end of the day, the LP who gave you 10 to invest in a business that exited for 20 will get back $18 million. So they covered their 10, they got 8 million in profits, and the 2 million goes to the VC fund that made that profit for them. In addition to the management fees that they've been paying year in, year out of that. So, uh, so that's a pretty straightforward example. It gets a little more complicated when you're talking about a bunch of different deals timing of distributions, all of that. Uh, it's not important to understand that. It's just important, in my opinion, to understand the concept. Um, so achieving carry is a fund-wide hurdle, though. So I do want to dig into this a little bit, um, which can be an interesting, generally it's a fund-wide hurdle. And so it can be an interesting uh, and sometimes awkward issue among partners at a VC fund, one who maybe had a really bad fund and made a lot of really bad investments, and one who has crushed it and basically owned that entire third of like crazy uh, outcomes that really generated the entire return. Sometimes, depending on the manager, et cetera, they may have more allocation to the, to the carry that they generated, but generally it's a fund-wide return. So everybody shares in the successes and everybody shares in the failures. Um, and again, it's kind of a, across that entire fund. So that $100 million fund, if it ultimately returned to its investors $120 million, uh, that carry is spread across all GPs in the fund. Um, so again, partners who perform well can achieve, cannot achieve carry due to poor performance overall, right? So they have a couple of, they did three deals and they're great wins, but the rest of the portfolio was kind of junk and didn't return anything. You know, sucks to be them. Uh, they, uh, they rely on their partners to generate returns as well. Again, not always the case, but the general rule. Okay, um, everybody with me so far? Is this, am I going at an okay pace? Okay, cool. Um, so continuing on mechanics, which probably is the wrong term for this, but uh, I wanted three clean categories. Um, roles and responsibilities within a fund. 
Um, there are lots of different roles, a lot of different funds call people different things, uh, but generally it kind of falls into these categories. And I've made this sort of an inverted pyramid for a reason. There are really two types of funds out there in terms of how they build teams, if you will. Um, I, I guess I'd say three, but two types of funds. Um, one is what I would call a regular pyramid structure, which probably most people are familiar with in like a general corporate setting, right? You have a lot of people kind of on the bottom doing stuff and it kind of gets narrower and then you have a guy at the top or a gal at the top that's making all the decisions and sort of trickling down. Um, a lot of other funds have what we call an inverted pyramid, where actually you have few people at the bottom, you may have one or two associates who are doing a whole lot of work uh, supporting a lot of decision makers at the top. And in, in a venture fund, you see this a lot just because, again, uh, the, the GPs, the managing directors and general partners, and sometimes the principals, but these are generally the folks making investment decisions uh, and sitting on the boards of companies, interacting with the companies. And so they need to be sort of armed uh, with other knowledge uh, and information that is generated by the folks below them. But they also need to have enough people at that level to maintain connections and monitor their portfolios in an effective way. So an individual, for example, when I was in venture, I think we got to a point where I, I, was, I was an inverted pyramid structure, I was a senior associate principal and there were three partners above me and we got to a point where like every partner was on like 12 different boards, right? Which basically that becomes their life. And we're also raising a new fund, uh, we're also investing in new stuff uh, and they're flying around the country, sometimes around the globe to attend board meetings in person every quarter for 12 different companies. So having a lot more folks up there can make a lot of sense um, uh, to handle that workload. But I'm just gonna quickly cover these uh, and bear with me. Uh, so let's start at the bottom. So analysts, um, and this first comment applies to, to everybody in the stack, are generally really, really smart people. Uh, generally probably maybe just out of college or, or graduate school. Uh, usually just out of college. Um, and they generally do a lot of important work that nobody else really wants to do. So that's kind of crunching numbers, writing memos, everything that sort of just kind of needs to be done that a GP or a partner just probably isn't gonna spend time doing and, and a principal and, and senior associate are either. Um, associates are typically not deal partners and by that I mean they're not making decisions around yes, we should, you know, we will invest, uh, but they can inf influence that decision pretty significantly. Um, but they generally support one or more deal partners. So they generally are assigned, you're at a fund with 10 different partners, uh, each may focus on sort of a different segment or have a speciality. Uh, an associate may be assigned to two or three of those to sort of support the research, the work uh, that may be coming from the analyst or just being generated by the associate themselves. Help with due diligence, they write internal investment memos, they share their opinions on deals or founders that they met with, why they should have a full meeting with the partnership, et cetera. Um, and that's an important point as well. Um, I think there's a lot of founder frustration sometimes when they reach out to a VC fund and they get connected to an associate. And they're like, why am I talking to this person? Does he have any actually decision-making capability? And the answer is no, but they generally have significant or somewhat uh, a degree of influence over the ultimate decision. So yes, they are gatekeepers. They are people that need to be sort of that first blush. Does this fit with our investment thesis? Will this be a waste of time for people, for both the founder and the GP to come in and give the pitch and say, actually, we don't invest in Series A companies? Things like that, right? That you can kind of get out of the way at that level. So making a good impression and building a relationship with an associate at a fund shouldn't be your primary objective, but you should also not, my personal advice, don't dismiss it out of hand. If you can get them on your side, they're gonna be proponents of the deal uh, because really their primary objective in all of this, they don't have carry in the fund, they don't have economic interests. Their objective is to get deals into the fund, to be viewed as the associate, the fund that identifies good deals and can effectively convince people to make investments in it. So they'll be your partner if you treat them right and, and approach them and sort of collaborate with them in some ways. Uh, same thing on the principals and associates, senior associate side. But these folks are folks who are now kind of moved up. They're really the next generation of uh, managing directors and, and GPs, right? The folks who are kind of being groomed to be moved to that partner level. Um, you know, some have left and gone to graduate school. Some have gone off and founded their own companies, had an exit, come back. Uh, they've kind of usually done something else, and some haven't done that at all. Some have stayed at the fund and just grinded it out and, and moved up the, the ranks. Um, but uh, they're junior deal partners. So sometimes you'll see senior associates and principals sitting at the table where they are making the investment decision and highly influencing that decision. People deferring to them and saying, well, what's your thought? Should we go, no go? Uh, and oftentimes that'll result in them sitting on boards or sitting as, as a, a observer seats on boards where they don't actually have a board seat but they're given access to the board materials and the meetings. 
uh, and sometimes they're trying to do to participate. Um, so, and generally they're aligned directly with like one partner, right? They're like the, that guy's guy or that uh, person's person. So, um, uh, again, so these are kind of the next gen of managing directors and, and GPs. Uh, there's actually even an organization in Silicon Valley, I think it might be in New York now too, I don't know if people have heard of it, called NextGen. <laughs> it's basically a networking group for these folks, right? They're not partners yet, uh, but they will be someday, and so they're bec all becoming friends uh, before that happens, so they can send each other deals uh, seven years from now. Um, and then there's managing directors and GPs, which are, you know, the folks who either founded the firm, were brought in to be sort of sitting on, sitting on boards, ultimately making the decision. They generally sit on what you call the investment committee, uh, which if you've raised funds or if you're familiar with the territory, oftentimes you'll meet with somebody, an associate, a senior associate, a partner. You'll have a meeting and they say, great, on Monday we're having our investment committee call, so we'll talk about this and we'll get back to you with, you know, if we want to go to next steps. Those are almost generally on Mondays, by the way, almost always. Uh, but these are the folks that sit in that investment committee and sort of raise their hand, yay or nay. Should we move to the next step? Should we have them come in and pitch to the whole firm? Uh, or to the specific partner, uh, or even further down the pipeline, are we, gonna, are we gonna do this, yay or nay, and then let's start talking about terms of the actual deal. Uh, so these are the decision makers uh, at the very top of the, uh, top of the pile. Last thing here um, is there's also a whole lot of other roles, right? And again, this, this in particular is an area that at different funds, um, uh, different funds have different things. So venture partners, uh, entrepreneurs and residents, operating partners generally are all there in one way to either help the fund source deals or to add value and help uh, portfolio companies on specific projects like helping to build out the sales team or coming up with a marketing plan or things like that. Uh, we, only have few, we only have about 10 minutes left, so I'm gonna try to race through this. Okay, so VC mechanics sourcing to the wire. Again, we hit on this a little bit earlier um, in an earlier slide, but VCs look at thousands and thousands of deals a year, you know, sometimes more, sometimes less. Generally, they invest in somewhere between one and 4% of the deals they look at. So don't be surprised if you hear no a lot. It's just the, the law of big numbers. They're, only, they're looking at 1,000 deals a year and they're only investing in 2%. Um, deal flow comes from a variety of sources. Um, generally, it can come from, I think most predominantly, it comes from other VCs, uh, trusted nodes in their networks. Uh, again, this next-gen network, a lot of VCs like to network with each other, share where their wheelhouse is, where they invest, uh, where they pull the trigger, uh, so that when another VC meets with a company that doesn't fit in their wheelhouse, they can send it down the line to VC X down, the, down Sand Hill Road uh, and add value to the person they had to say no to, as well as adding value to the VC that they're sending the deal to. Um, and it comes in a variety of other forms as well, right? There's a lot of cold intros, uh, people reaching out on their own, those are viable ways, generally less successful. A uh, warm intro is generally always the best way. Find someone that knows someone there, pitch them on your business and have them make an intro. You generally be much more successful um, in getting in front of them. Um, so I'm gonna skip to the rest of this just because I wanna make sure we get some other stuff. VCs uh, also sort of, uh, when it comes to time, VCs invest across the different stages. You show that early stage investment funds or late stage funds. Early stage, we like SB Angel in uh, Silicon Valley in San Francisco. Pretty much predominantly invest in seed or even pre-seed deals these days. Uh, institutional venture partners, IVP, another Silicon, another Silicon Valley fund, almost exclusively invest in series like C and later. Um, and so there's definitely people who take sort of different tacks to each stage. But really what they focus on at each stage is what I wanna cover here, which is early stage, uh, really founder focused, right? A lot of these companies don't have the metrics to really evaluate. It's, it, it's generally like kind of just post ideation. It's really about the founder and the small team he or she has built around them. Uh, it's about ideation risk. Is this product actually going, it, do people actually want this? Is this something actually gonna work? Uh, and product market fit, right? So finding like, is this idea something that actually is meaningful and viable? Generally at this stage, they'll take more of the company uh, just because it's earlier. Generally it's 20 to 30% they'll end up with after doing an early stage deal. Um, smaller investments with potential for higher multiples. So smaller checks, they're gonna be in it probably a little bit longer, but they're gonna be able to potentially return uh, more on that small investment uh, in terms of a multiple. Mid-stage is more of what we call traditional VC. Again, where I came from is like Series B through pre-IPO, you know, five, six, seven years ago. This is more now probably like Series A through pre-IPO, like I said. Um, but it's really focused on the team, you know, beyond just the founder. What's the team? Do we have the right people in place? Is this thing ready to rock? If we pour some gasoline on this fire, are all the right people there to sort of make sure it uh, is, is focused in the right direction? Uh, it's about traction and scaling risk. So we have the idea, we know it works. 
can we go sell and market this effectively? Can we build the right mechanisms to do that? Um, is it something that can be consumed like that? Or is it something that's just niche and valuable to this one segment and not broadly valuable? Uh, and again, it's about pouring gas in the fire at this, at this stage. Late stage is more about exit risk. What is the valuation I can get out based on if the IPO window is open? Or I'm investing in an enterprise SaaS company uh, you know, at a $400 million valuation. What is the current multiples in public markets for SaaS companies? Do I think I can make, do you think that I can, this can go public for 800 million and I can double my money? So making smaller multiple on investment capital returns, uh, but on much larger checks. Uh, and you see, a while ago you saw a lot more mix in here uh, of non-traditional VCs, mutual funds, private equity funds, other folks getting involved this later stage, essentially getting involved in, in businesses before they IPO, so getting hopefully a lower price. Um, so VC capital and time, the VC alphabet, FIFO principle is key to understanding how venture capital returns work. First in, first out, I'm sorry, last in, it should be LIFO, sorry, I screw this one up every time. Should be LIFO, last in, first out, my bad. Um, uh, so the last money in is generally the first money out. So if you invest in that Series D round uh, and you exit you know, the next week, you'll get your money back first, then the Series C, then the Series B, then the Series A. If there's anything left over for the seed, they'll get some. If there's anything left over for the common, they'll get some. So again, that's important to think about as founders because generally you'll be owners of common unless you're investing in your own rounds. And so you gotta understand that structure of when you're thinking about an exit, who gets paid first and how that waterfall trickles down to you. Um, in VC 201, uh, which I might be doing here at this loft later this year, we go much more into that, looking at sort of that waterfall effect. Um, I'll skip seed, generally common. There's a lot of other stuff like, like safes and stuff like that that's happening now in the world. Uh, but series A, B, C, D, one of my pet peeves is I, and just my opinion, a lot of people don't seem to share it, but people sort of talk about series A, B, C, and D as they actually mean something very specific about the company and the stage. That can be true. Like generally a series B company is X. But what it really means is this is the type of stock that was issued in that transaction. So just because somebody raises a series A, it could be a $50 million series A, or it could be a $2 million series A. Um, and they could have a lot of different reasons for the stage of the business that they're at. Um, all these issuances are tracked in what they call a cap table or a capitalization table, which again is just a manifestation of who owns what, how much, and at what valuation. So everyone can keep track of that. Um, and then this waterfall analysis, which I won't go into, but essentially is what I described, sort of like last, or last money in, first money out, and then kind of on down the stack. Okay, summary wrap up, uh, tidbits here. Again, uh, venture capital, the bargain that you're sort of striking here. Um, VCs rarely want to control a company or have o o undue influence when it's going well. Generally, VCs get more involved and spend more time with a company when it's going poorly. There's an inverse correlation between the amount of time a VC spends on board calls, in board meetings, talking with the CEO, and the success of a company. That's anecdotal, but that's almost universally true. If something is working really well and you have the right team in place, a VC should really just kind of be hands off and let those folks do their job and, and go to work. Um, but you are giving up some control, right? You're giving up a board seat, you're giving up some ownership, and then by the end of your, your investment period or the time you're raising capital, oftentimes founders will own you know, less than 10% of the business. Sometimes more, but sometimes less. Uh, and so that's important to understand as you continue to raise these rounds and you kind of dilute yourself out of ownership. Uh, liquidation preference, investors typically have the rights to get their money out first. We talked about the LIFO principle. Uh, liquidation preference is even a more uh, nuanced concept in terms of sometimes they'll bake in, I get double my money out first before anybody. Uh, that's less popular right now because of the dynamics of the market, but in 2008, we never did a deal where we didn't have at least a 2X liquidation preference. Uh, and again, that's covered in 201, which I know is probably frustrating because we're not gonna cover it here, but uh, that's a concept to be familiar with uh, and look at. And then dilution, uh, which we hit on just a second ago. So this is a glimpse of VC 201. I'm gonna quickly go through this, pre-money versus post-money. You hear that term thrown around a lot in terms of valuation. Pre-money is essentially the valuation placed on the idea, the concept of a business, uh, saying at this moment, I believe your company is worth X. Post-money is, I believe your company is worth X, and I'm gonna put Y amount of money into it, add those two together, and now capital plus idea equals post-money. Uh, that's an oversimplification, um, but that's the concept uh, highlighted by these images of a light bulb and a bag of cash. Um, and then I promised to hit on this. Uh, do people want to do Q&A or do you want me to continue through this? We have two slides, do you want to look at this? Okay. So venture capital, uh, other flavors of VC, right? So I talked a lot about traditional VC. Uh, and again, those are the folks that I talked about. Venture funds that are set up. You also have you know, a, a, an emergence and have for a long time of angel investors and even super angels. 
generally individuals that are coming in most often have a good amount of money from an exit that they made in startup land in some way. Not always the case, but that's generally where they come from. Uh, and they're there both as like kind of early stage mentors as well as uh, capital injections at the earliest stage, so even before seed rounds, right? Raising a few hundred thousand dollars from some angels. A lot of angels now also participate well up through the funding rounds because they have large pockets. Uh, but those are interesting angles to pursue as well uh, before you need to raise sort of that large round of institutional financing from a venture fund. Incubators are interesting. Um, incubators is compared to um, uh, accelerators, which we'll talk about. Really mentor periods, mentorship periods, uh, lasting kind of a year and a half, usually in within a corporation, kind of ideation, figure out an idea, we'll give you the tools and resources to do that. And then we may or may not take an equity stake uh, when you decide to go out and launch, maybe you join an accelerator, or maybe you raise a fund. Uh, but it's exactly like it sounds. It's a kind of an incubation period uh, in a safe place to kind of practice your idea and, and get out there. Uh, accelerators are, are a little bit different in that they're a fixed term cohort based program. Uh, they include mentorship, educational components, and culminate in a, usually a public pitch event where they invite a bunch of VCs from those firms I mentioned. Everybody gets up, does a demo day, pitch, and then afterwards kind of do handshake deals a lot of the time of like, would love to invest, let's figure out the deal terms. And that success in an accelerator is generally raising venture capital from that, from that, um, from that deal. Uh, and then corporate VCs, which I'll go into a little bit here. So corporate VCs um, are great for a lot of reasons and also something to be wary of for other reasons. Um, so why do it? They leverage existing businesses, they inspire new products, they give you access to new technology. Uh, they, they help uh, themselves identify new markets. It also helps them kind of be cool and extend the brand and be out there in the market, understand what's going on. Uh, but they also have fluctuating internal support, so they're not that steady state of folks at the top. They're GPs. A lot more bureaucracy generally goes into it. People making the decision on yes or no are not generally the people who you're talking to all the time. Uh, it's somebody further up the corporate stack. That's not always the case, but that's sometimes. Sometimes shorter sighted, uh, not always strategic, you know, more strategically aligned. And when that strategy changes, now you're a little less valuable to them. That's a risk. It could also go the other way. That strategy becomes more important, and now you're much more valuable to them. Uh, varying value add and sometimes conflict of interest uh, when other things overlap. Uh, and then this is just other reading. Uh, I don't know if we're distributing the decks. I know I'm over time, so I apologize. But uh, if we are, this will be in there. If they're not, feel free to do what everyone's doing, which is take a picture. Um, I don't know if I have time for Q&A. One or two questions, no? OK, sorry, I don't. But thank you guys very much. Hopefully that was helpful. One question. OK, one question. Sorry, one Thank you. Appreciate the applause. Mike. Oh. Hi there. Uh, thank you for a great talk. I, my question is, as a founder, now you laid out the, the, all the different type of VCs and other investments that's possible. As a founder, how do I go about selecting the right one, sure. right VC, or what do I look for? Oh, yeah, it's, it's one of those classic questions of it depends. But uh, the best things to do in terms of like doing your own research before you reach out, one of the most powerful things you can do when you reach out to just a VC is be educated on what they do, why they do it, and how that aligns with what your business does. So not, not, not that you care about annoying people, but just in terms of getting reactions or, or feedback, when you reach out to someone and say, hey, I'm raising a Series A, I'm in digital media, and you know, we're raising uh, $4 million. And then that guy gets an email and he says, I don't invest in digital media, I only invest in Series C companies, uh, and our, biggest, you know, our minimum check size is 10. Right? Not having done that legwork, you burn time just putting that email together, you probably burned a little reputation with that person because they're like, why, is this, why would I invest in this person if they even haven't, haven't taken the time to even research me? So doing that, you know, going and, and sort of looking at the funds that you know invest in your space and have been successful in doing so, speak publicly about why they're excited about that space, uh, and then do a little bit of your own research and homework on the partners. And again, if you don't know them directly, the best advice I can give is spend time trying to find somebody in their network that you may know a little bit more uh, which can also help with your diligence on the person, but sell them on your vision for the business and why you think you're gonna uh, add value and not take advantage of their introduction to that VC and get them to make a warm intro for you. Nothing beats a warm intro. Cold intros sometimes work. Warm intros don't always work, but they generally at least will, will give you the time of day and an opportunity to state your case. So hopefully that answered your question. Okay, cool. Thank you guys, everybody. Appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon.